Greetings and salutations to all you folks out there. It is a good day and I think I've got a good game to match it. We're going to be on the map diversity today. This is version 8. I believe this is the newest version so it should have everything corrected as far as the minor irregularities in the balance of the map. And we've got some pretty good players here. We've got 1300 all the way up to 1800 on evenly balanced teams. So let's go ahead and introduce these guys and then we'll jump straight into the action. We've got H Master taking the the customary UEF on the north side in the orange color. Um, we've actually seen him in quite a few casts. It'll be interesting to see how he does. Mephi taking Aeon in the center. I think sometimes this slot does do air, but I have yet to see a designated air play on diversity. Everybody kind of tends to just mash up in the middle, which I do like. Below that, we have Cubic Cube. What is better than one cube? Two cubes. Cube Cubed. There's a lot of things that you could do with that name, but he is taking Cybern and it is in the brilliant pink color. And in softer baby pink below that, we've got Silent. He is going to play as Seraphim, which is nice by the water. You can hide in the water and shoot tack missiles at everyone or, you know, throw some navy in there with that cruiser. Search for Destroy. Shouldn't that be Search and Destroy? I don't know. Perhaps he's not making a musical illusion. He is in the red cybern color on the right-hand team. We've got Uga Uga's Master. There is an Uga Uga's Monkey, too. I'm assuming these guys are in the same clan. If not, they must be friends, because I really fail to see two Uga Uga's meeting by chance. Monkey is taking Cybern in the burnt red color up there. And Master is taking Seraphim in the gray. And then finally, we have Corwin taking UEF in the middle here. We've got a nice little bit of early aggression going on. We've got two hunters headed across to the right here. We've got a single hunter in the south that has actually got two kills on him already, picking off two scouts and an engineer. That is a greedy, greedy hunter. He has eaten his fill and he's looking for more. And then on this side, let's see, these guys are probably going to head into the expansion over here. Since the ACU is not moving forward. Oh, that is a large chunk of mass right there. And see, Uga is overbuilding power next to his mass extractors, which means early upgrades off of Reclaim. Not a bad plan, I must say. These two hunters are going to pick up a couple of engineer kills on the way over. And then on the north side, looks like we have a pack of Mantis. Those do have a scout with them, and they are going to be headed to the left. I would imagine they're going to run the upward stretch here. If you can get units through around this backside, it's very hard to react to them over there. The ACU is typically going to head to the middle mass here, which there's really not that much mass. I mean, you can grab it. It's mostly T1 Rex. A lot of Mantis there, if you can see them kind of the burnt husks littering the ground. There's a T2 radar and a stealth that I believe were the same up here. Yeah, there's a mark on the ground. But not a terrible lot of mass in the middle. Then we got two Rhino Rex here with a couple of transports off to the sides. So this is a nicely balanced map. It has a little bit of mass, not too much. It encourages good gameplay and spam, and it encourages teamwork. Because if you can double team someone in the middle, it is good for your team. And if you fail to help out a teammate in the middle, well, you're all going to die. How slowly is yet to be determined, but if you don't help out your buds, you are going to die. We've got a bomber coming in on the south side. Oh, look, Frigate Rex. Nice. Everybody has mass. That is going to hover in here and bomb out the radar. A nice early target that's going to reduce the coverage that these guys can see and hopefully let that bomber last a little longer because... Uh, the ground units will not be able to react to it as quickly, and it's going to be a couple of seconds before that interceptor gets out. So that engine, that uh, bomber is going to do some damage. Five kills on it so far, probably going to pick up another engineer or two before it dies. Got these mantis moving over here, and here's the teamwork. There is a striker and a mantis working together to take out a mass extractor. When did you think the UEF and the Cybern would ever do anything together? Well, here it is. Ah, who am I kidding? They have an entire alliance set up. All right, this bomber is at six kills and still plugging away. It looks like it's going to land another right here. Almost got a double, but that engineer was on his way south. That is going to be a total of seven and eight, I think. Nicely done for that early bomber. Again, if you can get two engineer kills, it pays for itself. I think eight pretty well, yeah. 
That was one of the best bombers that you could possibly throw out early. Let's see what we got going on around here. We've got Monkey heading down towards the middle. H Master is already setting up shop here. He's got that mass extractor, and hopefully he can get an engineer down to himself to pick up that hydro. Well, it may be a good investment still. That is a very exposed location, but hydros are extremely cheap, pay for themselves very quickly, and that 100 mass boost can let you drop an extremely early gun. So, I can see the benefits, and I can see the downsides to it. You can see that... Is that... Yeah, that's Cubic Cube. You can see Cube's already thrown down his, but he does have a teammate with him at the front versus one person. So these guys are definitely going to be able to hold this position, whereas Orange, H Master, is throwing down some wall sections because he sees all of these units congregating. This is never a good thing when your ACU is out here all on his own with a couple of labs. Labs, you know, everybody loves their mech marines. They're such awesome tools and they go great with ghetto gunships, but... That's not exactly the unit you want to have backing up your ACU when you've got about 20 T1 units in an ACU closing on your commander. It's just not a good place to be. T1 bomber being shot down in the south side. And that is that. I did not see if there were any kills on it or not. I think it may have picked up an engineer out here somewhere, but it definitely did not have much. Search for Destroy is going to be laying down some fire on Silent. Silent backing up to him with some tanks here. Search is going to have to break right and get away from that. Escape while you can, good sir. And artillery coming in to try and hammer down that point defense. There's an engineer repairing it. Cube Cube is on an upgrade. That would be T2. We'll have to see if he is able to get it completed. It's always nice if you can force an ACU out of an upgrade with some T1 artillery, but alas, that is not always possible. Well, it would be if about a third of these were artillery because the tanks would be more than sufficient to kill off these couple of mantis here. And a jester coming to the front. You know we all love our jesters here. We're going to have to see how many of these he's going to produce. It looks like he is putting up a second and building a third. So we're going to see a few jesters out here. Whether or not we'll see an ACU sniper or not is to be determined, but I sincerely doubt it considering the amount of spam that's moving in. These guys are going to key up some mobile anti-air very quickly and be able to take care of that threat without too much of a problem. Once again, we've got Mantis skirting around the north end. These guys are going to close. The Medusa's nice shot. They are able to shoot over this cliff and destroy that Hydro, an extremely valuable target. Putting H Master, well, yeah, he's down on the bottom of the score chart right here. He is at 21 mass income, 344 power income, although I think some of that is overflow from his teammates. Bottom of the board on mass, other than Corwin, who is actually pulling in a fair little bit of reclaim. He does have some units scattered around here. These guys need to get some engineers out and reclaim all this mess so that they can recycle it into nice, shiny new tanks to hurl at their opponents. Got these jesters. One of them, yeah, it's one jester down, but the other two are providing some good cover fire on these T1 units. Now, I would say <clears throat> jesters are better used for raiding with proper air coverage because they're such an expensive unit at the T1 stage that you really need to push them to their maximum potential, which is not necessarily doing damage to T1 units that are headed towards your base. I'm not saying they're bad at it, because they can definitely kill off some T1 units, but they're just such nice units. They could be doing so much better things. Manta is moving all the way around the outside edge, showing off their speed versus the striker. Strikers moving in towards the base, assuming that these Mantis are going to loop back down through the power generators, but no, they are going to head for Mephi. Mephi's going to lose a mech in the back end, probably this mech here, which is bad, because you can see it is on about 35% of a T2 upgrade, so that is wasted mass all the way around. And nice little use of a transport here where you're going to have six strikers dropped in the path of the Mantis as they progress versus five Mantis, none of which are at full health. So that is going to stop the onslaught of the Cybern race. Mephi laying down a little bit of damage on this point defense. He is going to be able to eliminate it, and then he has a good backing of Auroras. However, triads, triads everywhere. Yellow is going to blockade the center. Uh, Corwin does have a good vantage point here. This is a raised hill. 
which is kind of a repetitive redundancy, but I'll throw it out there anyway. He's got four mass extractors up on it, and because of the commanding view, he is going to be able to lay down damage on anything that is approaching him without having to worry about his turrets firing into the dirt. You can see their ACU closing in. That's the double gun upgrade on the Aeon, that massive, massive range with the doubled up damage. Mevi is going to be taking fire though from three triads now. Even if he can kill one of them, I don't think he's going to be able to get all of them and maintain enough HP to survive any units closing on him. So he is going to back off, zigzagging just a little bit to try to dodge some point defense fire. Any shots that you can uh, get out of the way of is a help. I mean, it's doing a couple hundred damage per tick when those impact your ACU. So yeah, that is, that is a good thing to stop from happening, which is kind of an obvious observation, but uh, whatever. Sometimes, sometimes it is hilarious because people will get so comfortable playing with the game that they don't think about the obvious things, which is something that plagues me. Um, it seems like I take preventative measures against all of the stupid stuff that I'm used to dealing with, and then someone just kills me with basic T1 spam because I stuck my ACU in the wrong place. It's like everyone can learn something. Nobody is ever at the point where they can stop learning on a strategy game. T1 Bomber coming in, there's a nice tasty group of engineers down here in the right hand corner. It has two kills on it, but that loop was a little too close to actually snag any of those. It is going to just kind of keep lazily circling around, not being able to target on anything until finally, there we go. Nope, still not dropping a bomb. Oh well, we'll just have to see where that thing heads off to. We have a Salem Hot Diggity Dog, that is a, I love this. When you can throw up a Cybern T2 Naval Factory and get a Salem out on a narrow-necked land-based map, it is a good, good day. This thing is going to be able to harass everything for a long ways inland. You can see sitting out here comfortably in the bay with a huge speed advantage on the ACU, never going to get that thing overcharged and it's going to lay in a massive amount of damage on the outlying structures of this base. He does have a cruiser producing, which means that this destroyer is going to be almost impossible to kill with this stage of air. There's a attack launcher, but that is gonna be a fail. We've got T2 gunships coming out from Mephi. Mephi covering the front with T1 units and that oh so powerful Aeon double gun commander while he's throwing up T2 air in the back. So he is going to be covering his team's butts with that. He's got a swift wind out. He's got four T2 gunships, but he is going to have to get away from Corwin's base because he does have a substantial amount of anti-air there. And those are going to continue back and harass everything they can get their hands on progressing towards the back end of the base. That is the best possible use of gunships right there, folks. Oh, and Search for Destroy is gone. That is going to be our first death. Tangled up in all of that stuff, just could not get out of there. That's going to leave the lower end of the right-hand team greatly exposed. This is not good, folks. We got Zooey's moving in towards the right. We got gunships pounding on Uga Uga's base. I, I cannot get over that name. <laughs> whoever named, whoever came up with the name Uga Uga Monkey and Uga Uga's Master, um, you deserve an award, good sir. You have made my day. Um, so, <laughs> the harassment is strong with the left-hand team. That's going to make it very hard for Uga to expand into the southern base, and that's exactly what he needs to do. He needs to recover that eco as quickly as as he possibly can. These guys also need to get, I can't believe what I'm saying here. Uga Master shut off his T2 factory and he's building T1 anti-air. T2 Flak is substantially faster, does more DPS and does AOE damage to groups of gunships and he's not building it. He's building the slower T1 mobile anti-air. I do not understand. I legitimately do not understand. I really hope he watches this cast and next time builds flak because those gunships would be dead as a doornail right now if he had gotten one mobile flak up because all of these have some damage done to them. Two or three shots from the flak, all of those would have been gone. 
That was a serious misstep right there. And we've got the Salem has... Where did it go? There it is. Salem has landed. I thought it was up there. And there's a cruiser in the back, so this is going to provide a huge amount of anti-air coverage. You can see that circle right there. No air is going to be able to get anywhere near this. ACU is progressing with the anti-air cover, and the Salem is going to move up and kill off that T2 HQ, which is going to be a hard loss to take for H Master. He still got his ACU alive, but things are beginning to look bleak. So we have the left side folding in the northern corner and we have the right side struggling to keep up for the right hand team <clears throat> maybe this will be a trade that would be the best thing that could happen for the right hand team because right now it's not looking too good Uga wasted a lot I mean a lot of mass on that mobile anti-air he could have built two mobile flax and he would have been he would have spent about a third the mass or less than with all of this mobile anti-air and he would have been way better off. I, I still, I am still having trouble registering that he actually did that. Alright, Cuba Cube is going to shred his way through this group of Ilshivas, a few strategic overcharges and backed up by some rhinos and let me get my tongue untied and he is going to get this base. He's going to move in, get the reclaim, get the mass extractors. And, uh, oh wait, his teammate's actually getting the mass extractor. Silent, doing a fantastic job over there. H Master is declining in health. He's down to 7,400, but he does have a shield and a mobile shield over his ACU. If I were him, I would move this mobile shield way over to the side, let the stationary shield take the impacts until it's failed, and then move the mobile shield back in because when you stack shields on top of each other the damage transfers from shield to shield by a small percentage so that means you're depleting your mobile shield even though you don't have to and that's where this happens because both shields are down at the same time neither one is gonna get charged up for a few seconds we're gonna lose a TMD and probably a point defense and some build power there as well there was a nice little incursion on this side. Killed off a couple of power generators and a couple of engineers, but not much happened. Monkey was kind enough to send some units to Corwin's aid, and that eradicated the threat fairly painlessly. And then on the right-hand side, we do have a drop here. Silent picking up some more reclaim. I just realized that 1,700... Oh, no, they have 16 and 15s over here on this side. Okay, so it is... I would say this was probably an 85% balanced game. Left is making some tremendous progress though. He has the cruiser and two Salems. They are pounding away at that ACU, which was trying to close for an overcharge, but failed to get close enough. And yeah, now the mobile shield is down. He's down to 6,300 health. Looks like he is going to suicide into the Navy. If he can get in there and overcharge those couple of Salems, then he might be able to make his death worthwhile, but I don't know why he's doing this. There we go. He turned around a little bit. 2,200 health. He's got three ships on him. Four, five, and dead. Yes. There he goes. I was about to say, he keeps dodging. He keeps dodging. I thought he was going to be dead a couple of minutes ago. Mantis moving in. That is going to be easily dealt with by Mephi's strategically placed gunships. And then on the right hand side, we are seeing the problems caused by having too much anti-air built. It is clogging up the pathfinding for all of the other units. It means that he has less tanks built. Now he is throwing down T2 point defense to try to get a fire base up to prevent any further incursions into his territory. I know what I missed here. Right in the middle, just a little while back. Looks like a T1 artillery push from Mephi, judging by the wreckage. That killed off. There was a bank of tacks here that managed to kill one single mass extractor on the south side. And uh, that was it. So kind of a waste of mass on those tacks. They were promptly dealt with. Aeon is an extremely good faction for taking out stationary targets with T1 anti -air, or not T1 anti-air, T1 artillery. Their T1 artillery by far has the highest damage per mass of any of the factions. It is the most accurate, and it has the highest fire rate, which means it doesn't waste much damage. It retargets very quickly 
and moves on to kill something else. So com it has comparable effect to bases to the Zooey, but it costs 50% less. So there is that. Actually, it costs 30% less. The Zooey costs half again as much. Okay. Let's not talk about percentages because percentages confuse your brains. These gunships were able to take down one of the Salems, but unfortunately not all of them. That brilliant cruiser coverage in the back here from Ooga Ooga Monkey is doing a fantastic job of denying any air. Um, I have to say, Monkey did a pretty bang up job of dealing with this guy. He had some air to deal with from Mephi. He potentially had units to deal with, but he was able to kind of keep all that shoved away. And he did a phenomenal job getting these Salem's online and just beginning to harass. Now in the back here, we have a T3 HQ going down for Mephi. Mephi. That is probably gonna start uh, Harbingers. Yes, Harbingers. Had a mental lapse there for a second. Could not remember what those things were called. Aeon Harbingers. Those will be able to push out. They are very, very speedy and highly maneuverable, which means they'll be able to dodge around any of the shots fired by the Salem's and should be able to deal with them fairly quickly. On the right-hand side, we do finally have units pushing back southward from Uga Master. This is going to finally take back the southern expansion, I think, but there are Ilshivas moving to the north, and this is a very, very dangerous pack of units. Ilshivas get extremely strong when you have a bunch of them in one spot. They can even overwhelm a Percival or a Brick or two um, when they're in sufficient numbers without really taking any damage because they do have a lot of range um, and they do have a very high amount of damage packed into a small area because they're fairly costly units. T2 gunships moving up northward. Mephi trying to cover his base on the north corner while he pushes Harbingers out to the front. We do have one Salem down here that was overcharged by the ACU, and the other two are retreating to a safe distance in order to lay down some fire on the approaching units. You can see this Harbinger not taking a single shot. He is dodging and weaving back and forth, doing a really good job of preventing any damage from falling on him. And then the Ilshivas are going to be here just wrecking this expansion for Corwin. Um, so much damage in this little area here. Support factory going down, hydro, partially built T2 power, everything on that spot, and then those Ilshivas are going to move to the north. This is a tremendous amount of damage to be taking at this point in the game. This is effectively going to remove another player. Um, I know the ACU is still alive. I know that he still has build power out and around the front and some things going for him, but when you gut an economy, like is what is about to happen here, bad things happen to you. There is not an easy way to recover from that when your opponent is on the offensive. He's got multiple Harbingers out. He's got T2 gunships out. You've got to be pumping out units of your own to deal with the incoming threats. And if you're burning your time trying to reclaim and rebuild your base, you're just not going to be able to deal with things that are headed your way. Now, thankfully, he does have a very strong northern teammate who is in a good position to lay down some cover fire and push back his main opponent, Mephi, but it is only so much. I mean, there's only so much help that you can give when there's a marauding pack of Ilshivas just desecrating your homeland. Lots of T2 mobile missile launchers. Those are going to be trying to hammer a hole in Master's defenses. Thankfully, he does have a couple of TMD, which are going to be able to deal with a good portion of the incoming missiles and he does have a couple of units to front now what would be helpful is a couple of mobile missile launchers of his own or actually if he had a Salem that would be a good thing a Salem would help him out a ton because then he would ah finally finally mobile flak you can see all of the T2 gunships collectively fell out of the sky in a single little spot here because the two mobile flax rolled in and said we're not having any of this swat and down they came that's what should have happened ages ago the t2 gunship should not have been effective that long salem's not retreating like they should be harbingers closing to range and once they get into range that is gg for the salem's no way are they going to be able to take on four harbingers not in any one's lifespan 
Ugas is moving south. We're going to try to overcharge these T2 mobile missile launchers. T1 bomber coming in. That is actually a very handy tool. A couple of T1 mobile... Blah, 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 T1 bombers, if you pair them up and fire on these units... Actually, I think it's three or four. That was a nice overcharge there. Um, if you can get three or four bombers to hit a couple of mobile missile launchers with overlapping area of effect on the bombs you can very mass effectively deal with the mobile missile launchers with kamikaze bombers and this is bad we're about to lose another eco monkey is sending a salem south being the ever helpful teammate we've got hover tanks moving up from the north my goodness master is just getting gutted from both sides here Tanks moving in, killing off his build power, killing off his mexes. He is down to 13 mass income, but if he can survive this, he is going to have a ton of reclaim in his base. And he does actually have excess build power and the T2 ACU to back it up. So he can, he can pull out of this, but it's going to take some ingenuity and the longer this keeps going on, the less I'm thinking that that's actually an option. The Ilshivas just have so much health and damage. 3,000 health, 275. Yeah, a couple of these are carrying some veterans. 2,500, that's the stock health. 2,500 health and a little over 100 DPS. Brutal unit to deal with at T2. It is one of the T2 units we can legitimately call Tier 2.5. Cruisers are going to run. All of the Salems are dead. We got a pack of six Harbingers. That ACU is actually in a dangerous position at the moment. Because if those six Harbingers descended upon him and they were spread out, so it took six individual overcharges with there not being any point defense here. Ah, there, there. Now there is. There is a point defense now. Um, I was about to say, those six could potentially kill the ACU without him being able to do anything about it. Loyalist moving up and to the right. I think this is going to be the end of the game, folks. This is just continually... The right-hand team is being pushed back. It, there's no other way to put it. Uga Monkey is making a brave defense. There we go. Double overcharge. That's what you want. Your opponent to leave their unit sitting too close together to focus fire your ACU while the point defense is eating away at one of the targets and then overcharging the units as they come. Down to one Harbinger. That one is probably going to die to the cruisers and destroyer that is now online. And Monkey is going to get away at about half health. There was progress made on the southern side, but sadly, it is now being eaten away at. Master is being harassed again on the south. This is a very, very nice Salem. It is going to be able to kind of keep things at bay. Silent has some nice upgrades and vet on his ACU. There's another vet right there. Um, no, it wasn't either. He's he's waiting on a vet. I thought I saw the uh, health pop up. Um, between the point defense and the Salem, that ACU is going to get forced back. And then once the Salem moves up, that is the key right there. He's going to be able to lay in some fire on that mobile missile launcher and take it out. And that is exactly what needs to happen. Jester's moving in. Jester's still in use at 24 minutes. That has got to be a record. Six of them coming in to try and kill off these Ilshivas before they come in on the side. Uga's master is in the middle of building a radar, but he has paused. He must be using Eco Mod, which is probably what happened with his factory earlier. But you may want to consider either tweaking that or turning it off. Aha! T3 point defense. This may actually save the southern side. Corwin is sucking up some reclaim in the back here with this single engineer. He needs to get more factories rolling. He's got engineers coming out. He is popping up to 75 income periodically, reclaim 13k, and he's laying down T3 point defense. And this is going to be one in range to knock out some of these units over here, and then one even closer. This is going to prevent any mobile missile launchers from coming into range. Overcharge for your life! He did not come close to death, but he did shed a whole lot of health dealing with those Ulshavas, but they are in fact dealt with. This is going to prevent any mobile missile launcher from coming in range of this firebase, and it is also going to be a nice tool to force back 
belated, or not belated cube. I've cast a belated cube so many times. I see the cubic cube, I see the tail end cube, and I immediately think belated cube. Um, I'm just going to have to call him cube squared, I think. So he's going to force back cube squared, hopefully be able to take out this T2 power generator. I don't know if he's in range or not. Maybe. Yes, he is. Nice. And that will put some good pressure on the south side. Engineers being dropped by Silent. That is going to come in and try to snag some of this juicy reclaim laying down in the southern side. But I don't think it is going to do any good. Well, yeah, it is actually. Those Ilshivas are going to be able to deal with all the T1 down there. And that is once again going to fall into the hands of the southern team. My goodness, got a yawn in there. Salem's once again venturing onto the land, maybe a little bit more cautiously this time. We got one sitting in the bay and one kind of tentatively stepping in that direction. But there are so many harbingers up here for Mephi. Oh look, Harby drop. This could get interesting. Let's see where he's got this thing queued up. Not those, that. He's got a drop. Don't, d don't, no. Don't do that. Don't earn a strategic phase palm, please. That's not land, that's water. Now I'm intrigued. I, I am really hoping that I'm not going to see what I think I'm going to see. All right, Salem is moving forward. It's gonna start pushing a little bit harder on this position. We have T2 stationary artillery going up. QBQ of what are you doing? You don't want to do that. He is. He's dropping on the water side. No! No! Poor Harbingers. They were not built to be submarines. That is so sad. So very, very sad. Oh well. Such is life. <laughs> All right, so this, I'm not sure about this either, because when you already have a T3 point defense almost in range, and you have someone that could potentially creep you, you don't want to be building T2 stationary artillery right here, especially when it's not shielded, and especially when you have a Salem on your right side as well. Like, this is just not the ideal setup at all. Corwin started a fat boy. Not really sure why. He's throwing down a T3 generator, and he has been doing a fairly good job of getting his mass extractors upgraded back to T2. He's actually floating a little bit of mass. Nicely done, good sir. Way to go rebuilding that economy. He's reclaiming everything that he possibly can from the incursions that happen. He's get over here as well and suck some of this other stuff up. He may actually be able to regain his footing and help his team out. This T3 point defense are definitely helping keep units from passing right here. But when you have an ACU sitting on this side, it is pretty much already too late. And there is another swarm of jesters, another six from silent not silent cubic cube that is silent i am getting my name so confused mantis just about killed that t2 mass extractor they are trying here comes a t2 gunship i think it is going to kill those off before they can kill that it was very close another attempted at drop now we have a cruiser so this is going to be fail number two, a total. There's those Harby Rex. No, do they register? I don't think there's Harby Rex. Another two transports with Harbingers are probably going to get shot out of the sky right here. That will be fail in the second degree for Mephi. All of these factories going down, that is probably a control K for more build space. This is the proper way here. We've got Loyalists and Bricks ready to move in, and then we're stacking T3 Mobile Artillery. Two teammates working together in order to try and obliterate this firebase. I'm going to go ahead and bump up the speed a couple of ticks here, because I think we can safely conclude that this game is very, very nearly over, unless a miracle happens on the north side. We've got Hoplites in the right-hand corner, and a ton of T1 point defense going down, but... I gotta say, somebody would have to be pretty dang stupid to walk into that many point defense. I don't know how you could possibly... Unless you thought they were walls and just didn't scout at all, ever. Maybe. 
That's the only way I could see that. So not sure why he's building all that point defense, but hey, we'll let him do what he wants. All right, T3 Mobile Artillery was able to break down the shield, and that means it's time for the Loyalists and the Bricks to move in. And Corwin, you need to get the hell out of Dodge. Don't stand there. Too many Bricks. Overcharged one, but the other was not quite close enough. The rest are going to progress, landing an overcharge on the other. He's going to try to overcharge these groups of Bricks, but I'm telling you, there's too much DPS. Back off. Get away. There is no way that you can overcharge that many bricks fast enough to save yourself. They are pretty much just focus fired on that ACU at this point. Waiting for the nuclear annihilation. How much health we got left on this thing? And boom! Corwin is down. Dead. Done for. And the bricks are just going to keep walking. Like nobody's even there. All right, Monkey doing a fantastic job up here. He was able to deal with all of those Harbingers with the combination of Salem's, a shielded ACU, some overcharges, some hoplites. Nice little combination of units tucked away here with some Cerberus turrets to back it up and a long range attack mechanism in the form of a TML. And these are underappreciated, I feel like, at this stage of the game because you're gonna have groups of T3 mobile artillery mobile missile launchers, maybe even sniper bots as we're seeing right here, which are actually going down to the Salem. So, boo, boo, sticking your uh, sniper bots too close. But uh, you're actually able to snipe off semi-stationary targets with TML fairly easily, especially the cyber one because it has the fastest launching cycle out of any of the TMLs. Does a fantastic job of um, hitting targets that are right outside of the range of point defense and maybe even your Salem's like this mobile artillery which I think is actually going to die anyway so just something to think about that is one way that a TML may actually be able to pay for itself even though it is relatively expensive of course everybody knows how to ground fire fat boys with them the shield is so big that you really can't miss that but they do have uses outside of that I wouldn't build a bank of them but one one you can definitely make use of it is loaded to the gills, 10 out of 10. He could snipe off all of these support factories to reduce his opponent's build power. We've got an exposed mass extractor here. He can go over the top of this one, and he's actually able to snipe off both power generators of Mephis and probably the rear two mechs as well. He could do a lot of damage to this. He could potentially also ground fire the outside edge of this power generator. Because you can see, let's uh, click over to Mephi. That is the range of the TMD. So it's in a sphere. Uh, I don't know. That's a little too far away. Anyway, the Aeon TMD is very short range. So you can pretty easily get around it unless they build a TMD practically on top of everything that they're trying to protect. All right, Medusa's moving in. Salem's going to go down to these marauding harbingers. And yeah, it's kind of a stalemate on this side. Although overall, Mephi is pouring his eco into multiple other projects. So I think he's basically holding Monkey at bay while he builds up enough to try and do something on the right-hand side to end all of this madness. Silent taking damage from some jesters, really not going to accomplish a whole lot of those things. Um, Hoplites are actually doing more damage than the jesters were, I think. The Silent is going to land a couple of overcharges. These ACUs are going to be totally fine, and that is a high health ACU. That has got to have the nano regen on it and maximum veterancy. That's the only way you can get that much health with that level of ACU. And Mephi does have the shield, which is currently still on with only a sliver of health remaining. Bricks are moving in. Uga's master has been running. He was harassed by Bricks the same way as Corwin was, but he did manage to get out with his skin intact, but he's kind of moving back down into range. I figure at this point he's thinking that he has nothing else to lose, and he's just going to run down. Let's see what kind of intel these guys have. Yep, all those are marked point defense, so hopefully... Yeah, that side should be secure. Okay. So everything is going to be happening in this direction. Uga's, oh my word, 500 health. Get 
away. These sniper bots just eating away at his health. Although right now they're having terrain difficulties because of that ridge. Sniper bots just kind of firing into the ground there. That ACU would have been dead 10 shots ago if it weren't for that little ridge in the ground. And he is going to run northward. I don't know what he's running to. I do know what he's running from, but I do not know if he will actually make it anywhere. Salem's are kind of making headway, but I think that's only because Harbingers are building up into a bank again. Groups of units running in are always much stronger than single units streaming in because single units are very, very easy to kill. All right, Mephi, where are you headed? I'm gonna try to overcharge these things. He does have the extended range ACU, so he can't actually eat a hole through that. All right, Salem's are retreating. There's a couple of them dead, a couple of new ones. Harbingers are moving forward. I don't think that is going to be able to stand up to that onslaught. ACU is gonna have to withdraw on that one. Mephi just kind of standing back. Although, he is having the same terrain problems that the sniper bots were having on this side. Those did let the ACU slip away, but I think that is just gonna be revisited at a later date, and Monkey is down. Did not get away fast enough from those Harbingers, but with all the T3 mobile artillery on this side, I really don't think it mattered anymore. So the only person left alive is Uga's master, his, oh, that did not just happen. You've got to be kidding me. You have got to be kidding me. Mevi. Come on now. You're an 1800 player. Why are you doing this to yourself? Thought they were PGENs. No, you didn't. They were clearly marked on your radar. Very clearly marked. Point events. And you stood there overcharging them. <laughs> Probably a misplaced move order. All right. So that leaves one ACU. They're just going to have to hunt him down. I'm tempted to say that, hey, you can still make a comeback. You have one mass extractor guarded by all of these point events and your ACU is still alive and you have a tech one engineer that can build stuff. It's gonna build a, a uh, radar right back there. What can possibly defeat you if you have radar? But then again, you can kind of see the vast hordes of T3 moving in his direction along with a fully upgraded combat commander and you can kind of see that he's doomed it would be cool if he could slip over to the side and actually start something back up over here but i don't think you guys don't want to surrender just because i'm amazing i'll take my chances yeah i would too all right 3200 health on that com he's just going to take a dip nice refreshing swim to maybe get up his gumption don't think that it will make any difference though. And Brick's diving into the water. Ah, torpedo damage. That's what they need. T3 mobile artillery trying to be ground fired, but uh, yeah, it's really only damaging the Bricks, which are trying to kill the ACU. So not really helping guys. Knock it off. Uga's master trying to decide whether he wants to die underwater or above water. I gotta say I would prefer burning alive or being obliterated by nuclear fire to drowning, but. All right, Control-K, taking the easy way out before the torps kill him. All right, that is game. It was a little bit of a decline for the right side. There were a lot of things that were done very well and a lot of things, a lot of fails. Not quite enough to merit a facepalm cast, but there was some serious missteps in that one. I hope we all learned something from this. I know we all have those moments where it's like, I can't believe that I did that, but try to learn from them. That's all I'm going to say about that. And please, please save all of our faces from the brick walls nearby because sometimes we really want to take advantage of them. All right, with that, I'm going to cut out this cast. Hope you guys will join me next week for a cast i am not going to be doing a live cast this saturday because hooray i'm moving we've finally found a house that i can move to i'm going to get my own nice little office area so i'll be able to get all of my stuff set up and not be in the middle of the living room anymore we'll have room to spread out moving from a 450 square foot single bedroom apartment with boxes everywhere to an actual house which will be so fantastic 
But we're going to be very busy this weekend, so don't expect me with a live cast, but we will be posting some other random content over the course of the next few days and then back for a cast on Tuesday. So as always, thank you so much guys for watching, and I will see you guys over there.